All aboard, folks. We're off for Rockwell Field, California, to visit the school where Uncle Sam's Army aviators are trained in advanced navigation, keeping pace with the ever-increasing range, speed, and utility of the airplane as a weapon of national defense. The method of navigation, known as pilotage, is well known to every airplane pilot. Given a map and a fairly accurate compass, he is able to fly any course over normal terrain, compensate for drift, and check his position by observation of landmarks. However, the advance in airplane design, bringing forth fast aircraft capable of sustained flight for great distances over large bodies of water as well as over land, has prompted the Army to adapt to aviation the navigational methods of the mariner, namely, dead reckoning and celestial navigation, and to devise instruments to enable a pilot to accurately fly a given course, not only without the aid of landmarks, but entirely out of sight of the Earth's surface, if conditions so require. Among other things, student navigators are taught to fly entirely by instruments, to determine drift and ground speed by specially constructed instruments, and to determine position by sighting on celestial bodies with the bubble sextant. They are taught to compute courses and distances by mercator, parallel, and mid-latitude methods, how to compute great circle courses, and how to construct charts of any desired route, given only the latitude and longitude of the two points. Well, we're nearing the end of our journey. We are now looking down on beautiful San Diego, just a step from the Mexican border, and approaching Rockwell Field, where much of the early history of aviation was made. It was here that many of the pioneer military aviators received their early flying training. Now, the home of the Rockwell Air Depot and the 19th Bombardment Group, it is admirably suited in all respects for an advanced navigation school. Situated as it is, on the very shore of the Pacific Ocean, extended flights entirely over water can be practiced without loss of time. Seasonable fogs offer plenty of opportunity for practice in instrument flying, and the several islands located within cruising range assist materially in pursuing this training. The oiled map on which we are about to land is large enough to accommodate an entire group of aircraft and is one of the finest landing and takeoff surfaces in the world. Gentlemen, I'm very glad to see you here. I've arranged with Captain McClellan who is in charge of our navigation work, to give you a definite idea of the work which we are doing. Captain McClellan. Let's look at the curriculum of the school, and then watch the instruction as it progresses.
fog is encountered frequently while performing navigation missions over water, one of the chief requirements to the successful accomplishment of such missions is expertness in the technique of instrument flying, familiarly known as blind flying. The instructor is explaining essentials of this type of flying somewhat as follows. Instrument flying involves a distinct departure from the principles of the type of flying with which you are familiar in that your attention is focused on mechanical means of determining the attitude of your aircraft as opposed to obtaining this information by viewing the natural horizon and terrain by looking out of the cockpit. Perhaps the most important of these mechanical aids is the artificial horizon. To use this instrument effectively, you must imagine that you are seated in the miniature airplane which you see in the center of the instrument. The area surrounding this airplane represents the air through which you are flying. The horizontal line which you see bisecting this area represents the horizon. Any attitude which your miniature airplane adopt with reference to this horizon is an exact representation of the attitude of the aircraft which you are flying with reference to the natural horizon. The instrument next in importance is the directional gyro a non-magnetic compass actuated by gyroscopic action which registers accurately any change in direction, eliminating the spinning tendency common to the floating dial magnetic compass. Due to its inherent tendency to precess, this instrument does not replace the magnetic compass for navigational purposes, but it is invaluable for the purpose just explained. The sensitive altimeter enables you to maintain a constant altitude while keeping an even keel and a constant direction by observing the artificial horizon and directional gyro. The rate of climb indicator registers the rate of ascent or descent of the airplane. In the first stages of instrument flying training, the student is entirely enclosed by a hood which shuts off all outside view from the cockpit. Later in the course, he is given instruction in actually flying through clouds and fog. A dual control air airplane is used, enabling the instructor, who sits in the conventional open cockpit, to take full control at any time he so desires. He therefore occupies the role of safety pilot as well as instructor. Constant communication between the instructor and student is maintained through the radio interphone. Military operations often require takeoff when low fog covers the aerodrome. This condition presents no difficulty to the pilot trained to fly by instrument. He is sometimes required to land under the same conditions. Instrument landings are accomplished by the use of radio aid supplementing the aircraft instruments. In order that we may follow this procedure, a brief explanation of the radio compass is necessary. Although somewhat intricate in design and construction, its application is relatively simple. All that is required of the operator is to tune in on the broadcasting station toward which he desires to fly, switch to the visual indicator, and so guide his plane as to keep the arrow pointing to zero. If he varies from his course to the right or left, the needle pointer indicates the change of direction necessary to resume the desired course. When close to the radio station, the indicator becomes very sensitive, and as soon as the station is passed over, it reverses its action. This warns the pilot that he has arrived at his destination even though all view of the earth is obscured. To accomplish an instrument landing then, the pilot first locates his aerodrome by this method. Having done so, he tunes in on landing stations B and A in succession while headed away from the aerodrome, thereby so aligning his flight track that he passes over both stations in a straight line. He then reverses his course establishes his altitude at approximately 500 feet and directed by his radio compass flies to station A. Station A is located approximately one mile from the aerodrome. As he passes over this station, 
That fact is made known to him by a marker beacon, which actuates a light in his cockpit. He then tunes in on station B, throttles down to an airspeed, which, while maintaining level flight, will cause his plane to settle at a vertical rate of approximately 300 feet per minute. When the marker beacon at station B warns him that he is passing over that station, is transitioned to the amphibian type of aircraft. This is essentially a flying boat with retractable landing gear, making possible its operation from both land and water. Instrument flying is continued in this type of plane until the student becomes thoroughly proficient. Although the primary principles of operating land and sea aircraft are essentially identical, the technique of takeoff and landing is somewhat different. Accordingly, some instruction and practice in these phases are necessary. Here comes a student for his first water landing. Wow, what a bounce. But watch this one. Perfect. Now let's watch him take off. Note that the bow must be held well up until the hull is almost out of the water. On the step. Off she goes. Next comes airmanship at sea, training the student to manage his craft in event of a forced landing at sea, an eventuality which might result disastrously with untrained personnel. Unfortunately, such landings do not always occur at times when we can alight in a calm sea. When the opposite is true, the skill of the pilot is taxed to the utmost, both in effecting the landing and maneuvering his craft after reaching the water. Nor are his difficulties over upon approaching the beach. Notice how helpless the craft appears at the mercy of the waves and tides. No situation in the air demands a more steady hand, quicker reactions, or more skillful technique than this. Each military aircraft operating over water is equipped with a collapsible life raft. This occupies very little space when deflated, but it can be inflated quickly from a carbon dioxide tank, which forms part of the emergency equipment. When inflated, it is sufficient to sustain the weight of the entire crew. Being pneumatic, it cannot be swamped, making it a dependable, though somewhat awkward, lifeboat. Watch this fellow. He's from Kansas and getting his first initiation to saltwater. He'll be a seasoned sea dog before this course is completed. Student navigators are trained to perform all these functions including the correct use of the sea anchor and control of aircraft while being towed when disabled engines prevent it from proceeding under its own power. Through the courtesy of the United States Department of Agriculture, this course includes a series of lectures on aerology by Mr. Dean Blake, meteorologist in charge of the San Diego Weather Bureau. We live at the bottom of an ocean of air. Like the ocean of water, there are oblique, vertical, and horizontal currents. This is the aviator's highway, without a knowledge of which flying is apt to be extremely hazardous. Conditions along the highway cannot be controlled, but can be predicted and safeguarded. For this reason, meteorology or aerology should be made an integral part of the aviator's education. Throughout the course, the school day is equally divided between ground and air instruction. Classroom lectures are interspersed with exercises involving practical application of the subjects taught. First of all, each student is issued a complete navigation kit containing all the essential equipment to plot and log any mission which he may be called upon to perform. This includes a map case, a plotting board, a protractor, compass, dividers, 
parallel rulers, an aircraft plotter, an aircraft speed, time, distance calculator, an engineer's scale, pencils, and erasers. A compartment is provided for carrying pre-computed data and such mathematical tables as may be required in making necessary computations. This kit is a constant companion of the navigator while at work. The preliminaries having been disposed of, we are now ready to delve into the intricacies of advanced navigation. Our problem today is to compute, chart, and fly a course from Point Loma to Bishop's Rock, given only the latitude and the longitude of the two points. The latter point is a submerged rock, the position of which is marked merely by a marine buoy. From this coast and geodetic survey chart, we can obtain the approximate true course with a protractor in this manner, and the approximate distance by measuring on the latitude scale thus. But these are merely approximations and should not be used except when the distance is short and the probable error negligible. Moreover, a large-scale chart such as this is much too unwieldy for aircraft use. So we construct a condensed Mercator chart embracing the known latitudes and longitudes involved in our problem and compute the course and distance mathematically. By this means, we find the exact outgoing true course to be 262 degrees, 14 minutes, 22 seconds, and the distance, 96 and 3 tenths nautical miles. The return course, then, is the reciprocal of the outgoing course, or 82 degrees, 14 minutes, 22 seconds. Let's enter this data on our navigation log. Our initial position is Point Loma. True course, 262 and 1 fourth degrees. Known variation for the locality, 15 and 1 fourth degrees, giving us a magnetic course of 247 degrees. The compass correction card in our airplane shows a minus deviation of 1 and 1 half degrees. Hence, our original compass course is 245 and 1 half degrees, which is also our steering course. Later, a new steering course will be arrived at by adding or subtracting drift corrections as the latter are determined en route by use of the drift site. Ready for the takeoff. Each member of the crew is at his station, each with a specific duty to perform. Let's make them a call. I am the pilot. I fly as directed by the navigator, except when safety requires otherwise. I observe and report to the navigator all activity pertaining to the mission, giving approximate location and description of targets seen from the cockpit. Since I fly entirely by instrument, I require no outside view to successfully operate the airplane in accordance with the instructions of the navigator. Hence, for practice, I often fly with the windows curtain to shut out all outside view. While so doing, the safety pilot is on the lookout to avoid collision with other aircraft. I can operate the airplane in fog or cloud as skillfully as in clear atmosphere. My special instruments are the artificial horizon, directional gyro, sensitive altimeter, bank and turn, rate of climb, and the magnetic compass. I'm the navigator. I'm in command of the airplane and responsible for the success of the mission. I take the drift and ground speed meter readings, the uh, uh, all bearings and celestial observation. Keep the uh, operations base informed of our position by radio reports at regular intervals, giving our bearing and distance from some predetermined point. I communicate with the pilot by means of the radio interphone. My special instruments are the aperiodic compass, the drift and ground speed 
meter, the uh, thermometer, which records the temperature of the air through which we are flying. Like the pilot, I also have an airspeed indicator and a sensitive altimeter. I am the plotter. I keep our position constantly plotted and plot all bearings taken. I keep the navigation log, entering all data given me by the navigator. I am the radio operator. I maintain communication with the operations base, transmit all written messages filed by the navigator, and deliver to him all messages received. I immediately notify the navigator of any delay in transmitting messages. Throughout the course, the students perform the functions of pilot, navigator, and plotter alternately. In the advanced course, the plotter's functions are combined with those of the navigator. OK, all set. Let's watch them in action. Our present uh, elevation above sea level is 20 feet. Initial point, Point Roma. Steering course, 245 degrees and one half. Altitude desired, 1,000 feet. Take off at exactly 0800. Zero, zero. They're off. Two degrees left. Steady. Steady on. Okay. Speed is 104 knots. Estimated time of arrival, 0, 9, 0, 0.
The drift site and ground speed meter are of value only when the surface of the earth can be seen through them. When stationary objects can be picked out on the surface and followed through on the instrument, the drift and speed can be accurately determined. Since such objects are rarely present at sea, the navigator sights on bits of driftwood and similar objects and on ripples and light reflections on the surface of the water. China Point, five, nine. Distance from Point Loma, zero, eight, three, one, forty-seven, two-thirds nautical miles. Speed, 110 knots. Course OK. Estimated time of arrival, 0857, one half. All positions reported are plotted on the master chart in the base operations office, thereby maintaining a record of the positions of all planes at all times. Degrees right. Steady. About one degree left. Hold that. Steady. Steady on. Okay. The fog bank apparently covers a large area. I think we'd better climb up on top where I can get a sextant shot of the sun.
To determine line of position while in the air, the navigator uses a bubble sextant to decide on celestial bodies. The bubble provides the necessary artificial horizon. Otherwise, the procedure is almost identical with that of the marine sextant. A pre-computed altitude curve for the celestial bodies to be used is prepared before taking off, thus enabling the navigator to determine his position by merely comparing his observed altitude with the pre-computed altitude for the moment when the former was obtained. The line of position thus obtained is plotted on the navigator's chart. By this method, the normal error does not exceed five miles. water ahead. Okay. Drop down to 300 feet. Keep a sharp lookout for a Bishop Rock boy. Well, here we are at 858 and almost a bullseye. This is not an exaggerated example. Fully 90% of the students are able to do as well before completion of the course. Equal accuracy in a flight from Rockwell Field to Capitol Dome in Washington would result in no greater probable error than the distance from the... Our curriculum includes a thorough course in celestial navigation and its application to aviation. Instruction in this subject is under the personal direction of Mr. Harold Gaddy, navigator of the post-Gatty round-the-world flight, who has done much to adapt this science to military flying. It embraces lessons in practical astronomy, including star identification, solar and sidereal time and their relation to civil time, use of the sextant by day and night, computation of line of position problems, also, pre-computed altitude curves and numerous other ingenious methods of reducing the necessity for extended computations while in flight. A very important adjunct to all extended military flights, celestial navigation is particularly valuable in the performance of long-distance bombing missions made possible through the development of bombardment airplanes with a speed well over 200 miles per hour and a cruising radius of 1,000 miles. The military aircraft crew must be trained not only to fight, but to reach their objective, accomplish their mission, and return to their base with a minimum loss of time, personnel, and materiel. An important element of air strategy is concealment from the eyes of the enemy from above as well as from below. The best natural vehicles for concealment are those which are generally accepted as constituting the airman's greatest hazards namely clouds and fog. Trained as he is to fly for great distances by instrument alone, the military airman converts these hazards to advantages. The ideal day for a long-distance bombing mission is one on which the sky of the entire route is overcast or at least partially obscured by broken clouds. This condition enables him to cruise along sufficiently within the clouds to obtain the desired concealment coming out at intervals for short periods, either above the clouds for celestial observations or below for terrestrial observations, with which to check his dead reckoning.
Likewise, for purposes of concealment, such long-distance missions are often executed during hours of darkness, rendering the use of celestial aids to navigation of prime importance in accurately steering the required course. Should the sky be overcast, it is a simple matter for the well-trained navigator to climb above the clouds, where an unobstructed view of the celestial bodies awaits him. In this respect, he enjoys a distinct advantage over the mariner, who has no alternative but to proceed by dead reckoning, or to wait for the sky to clear. Before the advent of the airplane, the problem of defending our coast by keeping the enemy outside of striking distance of our shores devolved upon the artillery within the effective range of their guns, and on the naval surface craft beyond that point. That defense is now supplemented to an extremely important degree by aircraft, the speed of which enables it to cover a large area in a short period of time, giving it a decided advantage over its surface contemporaries. The military airplane, with its bomb load, may be likened to the artillery shell, since both are dispatched to destroy a given objective. But here the analogy ends. Opposed to the 25-mile effective range of the artillery shell, the bombing plane has an effective range of 500 miles. The artillery shell, once fired, is out of control. It cannot be recalled or redirected, whereas both can be accomplished in the case of the aircraft by the touch of a radio key at any time. To accomplish these missions, the military aviator must be trained not only to steer an accurate course to a fixed objective, but also, with like accuracy, to in intercept moving targets, such as enemy sea craft. Our instruction includes methods whereby the course necessary to accomplish the desired interception can be computed by the navigator while in flight, if conditions so require. However, the development of dependable aircraft radio makes it practicable for all data to be computed in the base operations office and communicated to the airplane, whereupon the latter can immediately proceed to the accomplishment of its assigned mission. To facilitate the solution of these problems, ingenious devices are employed, whereby the course and speed required to intercept such targets can be obtained accurately and quickly, eliminating the usual time-consuming calculations involved in graphical computations with vector diagrams. Likewise, in the same operation, the predicted time of intercept is obtained. To further assist in the execution of such missions, a radio bearing instrument is installed in the plotting room, enabling the plotter to obtain the exact bearing of any airplane with which he is in communication. Let's assume that a war is in progress. Our Pacific shores are about to be attacked. An observation airplane on offshore patrol radios to our operations office the information that an enemy battleship was sighted at 10.15 o'clock Bearing 264, distance 150 nautical miles from Point Loma, course 45, speed 18 knots. Peek over the plotter's shoulder and watch him at work. Having plotted this position on our chart, a few rapid calculations with the plotting instruments show us that if the target continues on its course without change of speed, an airplane dispatched from Rockwell Field at 10.30, making good a course of 272 degrees and a speed of 100 knots, can intercept and bomb the target at 11.48 o'clock, 28 and one half nautical miles from its original position. But our friend, the enemy, is quite unlikely to be thus accommodating. Thirty minutes after the airplane departs, our observation plane reports that the target has changed his course to 135 degrees and increased his speed to 22 knots. It requires but a few seconds to compute the new problem thus presented. 
and radio our bomber to change his course to 252 degrees, maintain his present speed, and intercept his target at 11.48 and a half o'clock. Thus, we see that although our figurative projectile was fired at 10.30 o'clock, it can be redirected as to course and speed at any time at the will of the commander who may be miles away. Aircraft has been seriously considered as a military weapon for barely 20 years. During that period, we have seen it progress from the clumsy, undependable contraption of yesterday to the speedy and reliable machine of today. What its future development may be, time alone will tell. But its possibilities are recognized. Landcraft is limited to land. Watercraft to water. Aircraft operating as it does in the third dimension, is limited only to the air, which for all practical purposes is boundless.